So I'm, I'm really um, honored and it's a pleasure to uh, be part of this really special session. Uh, we did have a, a keynote planned, but I think because you were able to come, we sort of managed to really make sure that we can get in this session. Um, so uh, happy to welcome uh, Per, who is the CEO of IKEA Foundation, um, with um, more than a decade of uh, experience in philanthropy, being a leader in the development and climate space. Uh, we're really happy to have you. Thank you so much for coming there. Thanks for having me. <laughs> it, this is wonderful. I think I see more of my colleagues around this room today than I normally see in the office. So I, that's, that's a really good start. Thanks a lot. Um, so I want to start off Pear, by you just uh, got out from COP and uh, you spent a while there. Um, what what are you most hopeful about? What's the hope coming out of COP? I'll get to that in a moment. But before I do that, I really want to thank you, thank Harris, thank Selko for putting this event together. It's just amazing to see so many um, people coming together and talking about really, really important issues in life. And the fact that you have put this conference together and actually you have the audacity to put the conference together with the, the subject of failure, I think is fantastic. And so far from my, my colleagues, I've heard, I just got in a few hours ago, but my colleagues told me that um, the, the attention to detail, the, the way you take care of every conference um, member here, it's just been fantastic. So I think we should give um, Selco and the team a big applause for what they've done. <laughs> then to COP. <laughs> In many ways, COP was a re really a huge disappointment. Um, disappointment because we didn't really make any progress on the key issue of cutting fossil fuels. Actually, we had to fight to actually get to stay on the Paris Agreement, which is not the way uh, we're going to make progress in, in the years to come and actually make it possible to cut greenhouse gases by 50% in eight years. So in that sense, this was a disappointment. Um, there were some really good things happening too. We shouldn't forget that. So the fact that the world uh, agreed to to fund the loss and damage fund so that the people in the world who have the least uh, responsibility for the impact of climate change but have, have really the, the, the most suffering from, from a result of the climate change actually get compensated in one way or another. Now, I, I realize this is a commitment to put a loss and damage fund in place and that's basically what it is and there's nothing more to it than right now. And my concern is that the commitment that the, the, the rich countries made in 2009 in, in Copenhagen to, to actually raise $100 billion a year uh, to support the poorer countries in the world has never happened to that level. And I wonder if the loss and damage fund is going to have the same uh, development. I hope not. I hope that we'll be able to see something very different. Now, let's talk about the hopes. Um, I think... Uh, what really gives me hope is um, partners like you, the partners we fund, and the huge uh, progress that we're making together in, in driving for a positive uh, development on the climate side. I think uh, we, we, last year we launched in, in, in Glasgow the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet. We, with an audacious goal on bringing access to renewable energy for a billion people in the world. Um, we made some real progress in the last 12 months. Uh, we're operating in 12 countries, we have 26 programs running, and we're bringing together an alliance of, of all those who want to actually contribute, governments, um, civil society, foundations, business, to actually drive this forward and accelerate in a way that otherwise wouldn't have been possible. That makes me hope. It makes me hope to see that the science-based target initiative that we started a few years ago is now having more than 3,000 companies committing to science-based target and basically committing to how they can maximize the, the, the um, effort they make as a company to, to, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Makes me very happy to see that the methane hub is finally taken off. Methane, as you know, is a very potent greenhouse gas and the methane hub is taking off and there are multiple foundations and organizations 
coming together to actually drive a focus on reducing methane. So, but the final thing and what makes me most important, most um, positive is, is the interaction I have with young people. And the fact that young people have a different perspective. They are the victim of climate change. Um, you know, I belong to the first generation that really fe felt the impact of climate change, and I'm also the last generation to do something about it. So I feel a huge responsibility for that. But young people encourages me to go faster, to do better. And uh, I thought I'd mention an initiative that we did at COP, which, which was a real risky project. We actually te you know, teamed up with the UN. We created something called the UN Live. UN Live basically pl placed 27 containers around the world. In that container, you can actually, through technology, have a meeting with young people anywhere in the world. And I had discussions with young people in Africa, in India. We had one here in Bangalore, uh, actually. And uh, bringing young people's voice to the table and those who are not at the table in, in COP, but need to be at the table. So we will use um, artificial intelligence, uh, thanks to MIT in, in Boston, to actually capture the key messages and the trends and the concepts, and we will share that. So this was a huge experiment, which is one other way of bringing young people to the table. So that makes me really optimistic. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. I think that's uh, really strong takeaways and hope for us as well. Three or four very strong points there. Um, I just want you to reflect a little bit on your journey. And till date, uh, was there anything that you would consider as your biggest success or IKEA foundations for that matter? Like, What would you consider as a success? Well, we had a lot of successes, but it's not really us having the success is our partners having the su success because all we do is provide money. Yeah. Our partners actually do the job. So if, if we work with you and we build uh, a long-term relationship to a Selco Foundation because we believe, believe Selco can make a difference, it's Selco making the difference. Yeah. We're just providing the money. I think if I look at the journey over all these years, um, what we have learned that's really important is that um, development takes time. Um, if you want to be part of driving a systems change, that takes a long time and requires a very uh, extraordinary collaboration. And I heard a lot from the last panel about collaboration, about uh, bringing different partners together, and, and most importantly, working with the people on the ground, and working with the young people, and working with the communities you're trying to help. Not try to sit in New York and London and Geneva and, and, and develop solutions that's going to work for those people. It's not going to work. And I think that one of the things we uh, started very early in our foundation is to, to see wherever we work, how we together with our partners and bring the people we're trying to help and, and, and empower to create a better life for themselves to be part of the solution. That's sort of what you do in business. I came from business, so in business that's an obvious thing. You talk to your customers and you understand your customers and you deliver against your customers' expectations. And I think that's where we made a journey from from being in a foundation that uh, provided uh, great charitable uh, funding to good causes to actually being a foundation that's focused on the two most important challenges to young people living in the global south, which is climate change sure. and poverty. Sure. So that's the only thing we work on, climate change and poverty. But why do you feel we should be talking about this more? Why do you feel we should be talking about failures, about dissecting successes, about learnings? Like, what is the criticality right now? So, you know, we, we, we can spend hundreds of millions of dollars every year as a foundation because mm -hmm. IKEA has been a very successful business. Right. The founder of IKEA sometimes came to meetings. He said, uh, so what have been your latest failures? He believed so strongly in learning from failure that you learn so much better from failures than you learn from successes. Yeah. And hiding failures was a sin in the organ yeah. IKEA organization, and it's still a sin. And it's a sin in our organization as well, because uh, there's nothing better to learn from than, than the failures. And um, that means also that you need to have a good system around all your grant making to actually uh, capture the learning from the grant making. So we put a lot of emphasis on on making sure we have a strong uh, and a robust system for monitoring and evaluation. Um, we monitor um, to create evidence and to build our future investments on, on, on that evidence. If we don't have, a, have evidence available, um, we will probably take a lot of risk 
And that's important because fun foundations should take risk. We are one of the few organizations that can actually take risk and fail if we fail responsibly. It's okay. Yeah. But we take risk and we drive learning out of that. So we put a lot of emphasis on, on trying to better understand what is the evidence available if we don't have evidence, what is the risk we're taking, and how do we make sure that we capture the learnings. Yeah. And to capture the learnings, working with partners means that you need to have a partnership that is built on trust, yeah. on transparency, that we can talk together about what should be a course correction in the middle of a program because, because things are not, doesn't seem to work. As Stephanie would say, just don't cut the funding and go away, but actually work with the partners to see how can we do this differently and how can we learn from that. Um, when we um, finalize a program um, and wonder where we're going to take it to the next level, uh, that's one discussion. But uh, equally important is that we invest in evaluating yeah. the success and the failures and evaluating the program and sharing that, those evaluations. So, Every year, uh, we will spend millions of dollars on specific evaluation, on uh, evaluation done by a neutral third party that looks, as the, looks at what has worked and what has not worked, and make sure that anyone who's interested can learn from that, because we share that learning with anyone who's interested. When we're not in a competitive environment, we just want to, to create as much impact as possible for the money we have available, and if others can not make the same mistakes that we did, that's good because we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Right. No, absolutely. I think you couldn't agree more. Trust and transparency can get us sort of multi uh, steps further. Um, before I get a couple of questions from the audience, so I'm going to ask the last question and then just open up a little bit for audience interaction. Um, but in in trying to do this, in trying to maintain trust, transparency, uh, you know, ensure that we're uh, failing fast and forward and productively, um, what are some of the top lessons that you have learned um, in, in philanthropy as a leader? What, what are some of the top lessons in doing this better? Well, it's really about how you build the partnerships and, and how you build partnerships uh, for the long term and how you build that partnership in a transparent and open way. And you know, that takes time. Building relationships is not happening. Whether you and I build a relationship or we build a relationship with you two organizations, that, that takes time. So you have to invest that time, personal time. It, and you can't do it, do it on Teams, by the way. It just doesn't work. <laughs> uh, so it requires you to go out and, and, and see people. And yeah. I think that's probably one of the key learnings. The second learning is you can't be successful without to, being very close to uh, the field, close to the people that you're trying to help, and creating a solution with the beneficiaries, with the people who are um, the ones that you want to try to help to take themselves out of poverty. Um, I also have learned something really important. I want to mention that so I have the chance before it's too late, okay? Because we, we have a situation in the world right now where we have, one, we have an absolute existential threat, and that's climate change. And if we can't curb climate change and succeed in, in, in what we set out to do in the, in, in the Paris Agreement, um, there won't be a livable planet for the next generations. You know, then everything else becomes secondary. And yet, 2%, less than 2% of philanthropy money today goes into climate change. Now that's a disgrace in one hand. But on the other side, you can say it's a huge opportunity because there's 98% of philanthropy money that's spent somewhere else that should be spent on, on climate change. So we can actually be successful in curbing climate change and then focus on all the other areas because access to energy in rural India makes no difference if you can't live there. Thank you, thank you so much, Fred. Thank you for your responses. I'm going to open up a little bit and see if we have any audience questions. Oh, there are already some questions on flux, but <laughs> I see some hands up as well. There's one question that's already uh, upvoted quite a bit, so maybe we start with that and then we can uh, take some audience questions. Um, so it says climate change or poverty are complex problems with many aspects causing them uh, and many aspects affected by them. How do you ensure you see them in a system lens uh, as a funder? Well. When we, when we focused on trying to provide, uh, provide energy to a billion people uh, in, in the global south, uh, we do that because we don't want the fossil fuel 
energy driven fossil fuel uh, fossil fuel driven energy to to expand in this part of the world you know this part of the world makes up so little of the total uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the world but that's where the biggest growth is so we need to ensure that the, that growth is happening in a clean way and and not driven by fossil fuels so it's 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 preventing new uh, t new emissions to happen at the same time working to curb the emissions that we have so that will have to happen in two different parts of the world because where the emissions are and where the biggest opportunities are in Europe North America China some, to some extent India um, that's a different story compared to actually providing energy to the poor if we can provide energy to the poor uh, that's going to be the biggest lever for economic development yeah. in, in in that part of the world and that's why we think that the combination of bringing, um, attacking climate change sure. and bringing energy to the poor means th that attacks the two key threats to children's future. The way we look at it is the climate change side and the ability to build a livelihood for yourself that that's sure. makes sure you can increase your income. And increasing your income, you will invest in your children's um, health and education because that's what people do typically. And then we can drive development as uh, in a parallel to curbing climate change, but it happens in two different ways, places. And I don't think that it's fair to um, in any way curb the economic development in, in, in the global south, yeah. um, just because we have been uh, doing what we've been doing in the Western world since the Industrial Revolution and put the world in, in a state where it's uh, about to falter unless we do something drastically. Right, yeah. No, absolutely. There is also a question here that's, uh, that says that, you know, IKEA championed modular design and do-it-yourself productization. Um, um, do these approaches have implications on how you've designed IKEA Foundation? I guess in general, uh, what are some of the key philosophies or from IKEA, the business, that have made it their way into IKEA Foundation? That's a great question. <laughs> Who came up with that question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. Um, I think the most important part that we have taken from IKEA to IKEA Foundation is a strong set of values that drives everything in IKEA. And IKEA is a company that is based on, on 10 base values, and if we had more time I'll talk about it, but I think one of the main uh, values that I want to talk about now is a value called togetherness. Um, we think, we, we really believe in collaboration, we believe in bringing the parties around the table, have a transparent discussion and make sure that everyone contributes and that everyone has a chance to contribute. So I think of everything we have done and taken with us from IKEA uh, and learned from IKEA, it's, it's really how we base uh, our work on, on the same set of values and that the values underpin the decisions we are making and uh, in, that, in that sense, um, Caring for people and planet is another value, and it's, it's driving everything IKEA does, and it's certainly driving everything we do. And we are super concerned about the trajectory that we see now, and we're going to do everything we can as a foundation to not only invest in organizations like, like Selco and others that are helping us curb climate change and bring energy to the poor, but also using our philanthropy money in a leveraged way. So, meaning that if we can take uh, our money to create that ecosystem that was discussed here, bringing in people who can create the ecosystem and then bring the big investors in, such as the big development banks, uh, for example, who sit in billions and billions of dollars, but don't want to really take the risk. We can de-risk that, and that's what we're trying to do. So if we de-risk with our philanthropy funds, we can maybe uh, achieve 10, 20, 30 times the amount of money going into installing renewable energy for those who have no access or very limited access to energy today. Sure. There are quite a few questions here. I'm pretty sure people will be approaching you outside, but I'm just going to, if, if it's fine, I'll just go with the top questions here and not open it out to in person so we can save some time. Sorry? Yeah. <laughs> uh, go, you were saying someone? Okay. So, um, <laughs> so, uh, one of the questions is also around um, your experience in sharing failures in a manner uh, that is inform in, that, that is productive and informative, but not seen negatively by others. So the perception around failure, uh, I'm not sure if that's a real perception or if that's easy uh, to deal with within IKEA Foundation and with partners, but uh, is there a way to curb the negative perception uh, around failure that you've experienced? 
Well, first I would say that what we're trying to do is not make this a perceptional failure, but have a have a robust uh, monitoring, learning, and, and evaluation system around it, so we can agree that what's what's success and what's failure. But in order to have a, an open and transparent uh, discussions about that, you have to have that relationship and trust. You need to understand uh, from a funder's perspective and from a partner's perspective that it's okay to fail if you do it responsibly and if you work to, to, to adjust quickly. And that's why we have this system where we, we monitor all the 179 grants we have operating right now. We have, clear three, we have three KPIs for each grant. Mm -hmm. And we have an ongoing reporting system that tells us whether we are on track to do what we need to do sure. or, or we have to make course corrections. But that's okay. Yeah. And that when we have partners we work with for a long time, they understand that this is the way we look at things. This is the way we'd like to optimize the impact of our investments. And you can only optimize the impact if you understand what works and what doesn't work. And you learn from your mistakes and learn from, from your failures. So I think, I hope we can create or we have created an environment uh, in our relationships to our 140 partners that this is okay to discuss and it's okay to fail if you do it responsibly, even if you course correct on, on what you do. And that doesn't mean that we're not gonna fund you in the future. That means that we have learned together and maybe can be even more effective in what we do in the future. No, thank you so much. But I think that's super important, not only for other philanthropists and funders to learn from, but for, I think, even for practitioners and the sector and enterprises and NGOs to sort of, you know, have that kind of, as, as Jay was also saying, that, okay, this is actually possible, that we can actually, you know, fail together, learn, grow together, and it's not a, uh, you know, there's, there, there, there need not be a negative connotation around it, which actually sort of prevents us uh, from moving forward as society. Um, I just want to thank you so much for being here, Pear. I know that you've not not had much rest even and managed to make, make it uh, for, um, for this event in time. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, we will close there and move for lunch. Yeah.